Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Bob. I uh, just wanted to record a quick video today regarding the uh, recent, now national news story uh, up in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan with the controversy surrounding the class of 2022's uh, medical school white coat ceremony and the protest of the speech by Dr. Christian Collier. Uh, I saw this story first um, from uh, a friend of mine here uh, where I live um, uh, who was asking me what my thoughts were on it um, and also sort of making some snarky remarks at the medical students. Um, the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court uh, on the basis of the Dobbs case in Mississippi is one of the more controversial items um, here in the United States, uh, politically, culturally, socially, um, that's happened uh, really not only this year, but um, probably within the last generation. That's kind of a crazy thing to say considering what's happened the past two and a half years uh, with uh, the current situation that we have, uh, wars that have been going on, um, uh, political upheavals and movements, uh, but the uh, abortion thing uh, is indeed uh, one of those issues that really brings uh, high emotions and uh, convictions uh, from both sides of the issue. Obviously, for those of you who follow this channel, you know where I stand. Uh, I am thoroughly pro-life. I do believe um, willful abortion, uh, intentional elective abortion, um, is in fact murder of the unborn. Uh, God's word is clear on this. Um, that uh, he has created us in his image, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, this um, principle is carried forward throughout the rest of the Tanakh, um, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, and carries forward into the New Testament. Um, the issue of unborn life in our culture is one of the great... Um, crimes, one of the great tragedies that has occurred uh, in the past 50 years in the United States. Um, I don't even think that the original, I believe it was seven justices who uh, ruled in favor of abortion in the original 1973 Roe v. Wade decision could have foreseen uh, the use of widespread elective abortion as a means of birth control um, when they first handed down that decision. Um, I don't think even the most uh, forceful or uh, ardent supporters of abortion in the late 60s and early 70s could have foreseen the tens of millions of children who would be murdered and have their lives snuffed out by that decision. Um, but uh, in addition to addressing uh, Dr. Collier's speech, uh, I also wanted to talk about the broader issue um, in Vinay Prasad's, uh, that was brought up in Vinay Prasad's commentary uh, on uh, Dr. Collier's speech, where he was talking about um, you know, the place in medicine for a diverse set of opinions. Um, and will there be a space in medicine for people who hold opinions like myself or like the tens of millions, uh, potentially hundreds of millions of other uh, evangelical Christians in the United States, um, our co-belligerents in the culture, uh, such as Mormons and Roman Catholics and those of an Eastern or Oriental Orthodox background uh, who hold similar, um, posi a similar position on the sanctity of human life as well as many other issues such as the right to bear arms, um, conservative economic policy, um, other pro-family 
uh, uh, limited government, uh, pro-freedom of religion policies uh, in the society is, will there be a place for us um, in the institutions going forward? Um, or will we as uh, Christian believers um, continue to be more and more sidelined and marginalized in the places of influence in our society? Um, I think that is uh, an open question and one I wanted to talk about after I discussed Dr. Collier's speech. Um, so yeah, I, I watched uh, the commencement uh, or the white coat ceremony on YouTube that uh, Dr. Prasad uh, had linked to. And uh, I skipped through the part of the video where the individual students were receiving their white coats um, and uh, watched the period of the uh, ceremony before that time as well as uh, Dr. Collier's speech after the students had received their white coats. Um, the first thought that I had was just... <laughs> How quickly time flies. Uh, it was roughly a decade ago um, when I went through my own white coat ceremony uh, at uh, the medical school that I attended, and uh, we had just sort of a <laughs> speaker I don't even remember much. Uh, I just remember one of the second year medical students at my medical school spoke and was talking about uh, one day the little white coat will turn into the big white coat and just about the journey of medicine and the high calling that we are called to as doctors. Um, and then we took our, our oath, which for those of you not in the, the know, most medical schools today do not use the traditional Hippocratic oath. They use uh, an oath that is made by the medical school that is oftentimes based on the Hippocratic oath, but... The actual uh, Hippocratic Oath is no longer used uh, in most medical schools. Um, so yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know what the white coat ceremony is, uh, Dr. Prasad did a good uh, job on his video, and I'll probably link to that in the description, just describing sort of the journey of what uh, happens with uh, medical students when they uh, first enter the medical profession. Um, so the basic track, at least here in the United States, uh, as well as in Canada, um, even though I think Canada might be a little bit different, in terms of what somebody has to go through to become a doctor, is that you have to go to college, you have to earn a four-year degree um, with certain pre-medical uh, prerequisite courses, such as biology, chemistry, a certain level of math, physics, um, a uh, certain amount of humanities courses, uh, social science courses that you have to take. Uh, and then uh, that can be in any major. So it can either be a STEM degree or a non-STEM degree. You can be a biology major, engineering major, poetry major. It doesn't matter so long as you take those prerequisite courses and then take the MCAT. Um, the MCAT uh, scoring is a little bit different today than it was when I took it, um, but that is used by medical colleges along with things like community service and leadership and grades and research and, uh, you know, uh, shadowing hours, um, healthcare exposure hours uh, to determine uh, who gets into medical school. Um, it's a big deal to be accepted into medical school. Um, and then uh, after a student is accepted to medical school, uh, he or she will show up uh, at that very first uh, uh, convocation, uh, that uh, initiating ceremony that is the white coat ceremony um, before medical school begins uh, to receive um, his or her white coat. Uh, and that is symbolic of the medical student's uh, entrance into the medical profession. Um, the white coat is a short white coat, uh, so for those of you who are in the hospital, and uh, especially at an academic center, and you're seeing uh, young people walking around with short white coats, oftentimes they'll have their medical school's patch or logo either on the shoulder or on the, the chest, um, 
of the, the coat, depending on uh, the school, um, that that person is a medical student. Uh, and then after graduating medical school, um, when somebody goes to a residency program, uh, they will then receive a long white coat, which is a recognition of the MD. Um, then the uh, young doctor will go through uh, training, which includes uh, uh, specialty training, which is what we call residency in the United States because doctors used to live in the hospital. Um, and then uh, from residency, uh, some physicians will do subspecialty training in what is called a, a fellowship program. Uh, fellowships are typically shorter than residency programs uh, because they're more focused in a subspecialty. So, for instance, you know, an orthopedic surgeon could do five or six years of orthopedic surgery residency and then go do a one-year fellowship in knee or spine or ankle or hand or whatever it might be. And so the specialty is orthopedic surgery. The subspecialty for which they do a fellowship would be, you know, knee-based orthopedic surgery, whatever it is. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, so I don't know the specifics of their field, but that's the general idea. And then after fellowship, uh, a physician finally reaches uh, sort of the, the end point of uh, the profession, uh, which is attending level. And uh, while there are distinctions, uh, especially in academic centers among attendings and in the private sector between physicians who are employed versus partners in a practice. Uh, everybody at that point is sort of equal in the eyes of the state and in the eyes of the medical board in terms of practicing medicine. Um, so that's the, the general path. Uh, but going back to the white coat ceremony and uh, starting to dive in a little bit into discussing Dr. Collier's uh, speech um, at the University of Michigan, um, the white coat ceremony is a special, special time in every prospective physician's life. And most medical schools will pick uh, typically uh, one medical student and then one uh, attending level physician uh, to give a talk or a motivational or an inspirational speech. Uh, typically short, only about 15 to 30 minutes at the very most. Um, most are typically only about 15 to 20 minutes um, to inspire and to encourage uh, the new medical student uh, upon his or her journey into the lifelong profession of medicine. Um, the practice of medicine, the profession of medicine is a unique field um, that uh, has its antecedents in ancient history, uh, carrying forward all the way to today, um, in which society entrusts one in that profession with uh, a sacred honor and a sacred duty um, that other professions, uh, they're not lesser than medicine. Um, they just don't carry that same um, unique uh, burden and that same unique responsibility uh, Patients will tell you as a doctor things that they may not even be willing to tell their husband or wife, their children, their parents. Um, a doctor may come to know a patient uh, in a deep and profound way that uh, nobody else knows. And it's all for the sake of treating uh, that patient uh, as a human being, as a person, um, to... Uh, bring that person to health, um, to heal a malady, to treat a disease, um, and to ultimately uh, allow that person to continue on with their life um, uh, to the best of their ability and uh, to pursue, uh, as our founders say in the Constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so uh, it's not like going to law school or business school or journalism school uh, or the other professions. Uh, medicine is unique among all the professions uh, in the, the highs and the lows, um, the good and the bad, um, the 
difficult and the mundane that uh, doctors deal with on a daily basis. Um, and so with that context being given, uh, I wanted to talk specifically about Dr. Collier's speech, um, which I actually found to be um, quite good. Uh, I know somebody uh, has already texted me uh, from a, a Christian brother who uh, did not think so, um, but I leave that uh, to him and uh, that conversation between me and him. Um, but Dr. Collier's thesis for her white coat ceremony speech was how to not only make it in medicine, but on how to thrive. And among that uh, thesis or under that thesis, she had three different um, points uh, that she wanted to drive home in the minds of the uh, medical students who were there. Uh, the first point is that uh, you are not a machine and neither are your patients. Uh, the second point was that we are to ask big questions. And the third is to practice gratitude. Uh, among the first subpoint of her thesis, you are not a machine and neither are your patients. Uh, this is something Dr. Prasad talked about in his video. Um, but uh, medicine can often become a dehumanizing experience both to the patient as well as to the physician who is practicing. Especially in this day and age of electronic medical records, um, which we see every note and every lab value and every imaging study and every medication order, a patient can just seem to be the composite of all of these values and statistics and notes that are in a chart, as opposed to a person uh, who has a past, who has a family, who has um, children or siblings, uh, who has a mom and a dad, uh, who has a job and goals and dreams and uh, a life that they are living. And uh, in these large, sterile-feeling institutions um, called hospitals that patients come to, uh, which are there to promote objectivity um, for the betterment of the treatment of the patient, uh, sometimes these, the environment in which we practice in um, and the sort of routineness of this very profound uh, relationship and uh, between the doctor and the patient uh, can cause us to lose the, um, the sublimity of what is actually happening in the doctor-patient relationship and in the life of the patient um, whom we are treating. Um, she mentioned a, a quote uh, from John Steinbeck and the Grapes of Wrath on man being more than the sum of his parts and that the farmer in that story you know, found true happiness not only in his own well-being but also in the well-being of his farm, the well-being of his fields and the plants, the crops that were growing in the field, the animals that he would be taking care of and that the soil wasn't merely the calcium and the silicon dioxide and the other minerals that make up the, the earth, but uh, there's this very philosophical and almost spiritual um, aspect to uh, a farmer and his land. And in the story of the Grapes of Wrath, which is about a family in the Depression moving from, I think it's either Arkansas or Oklahoma to California, uh, during the Great Depression, during the Dust Bowl era, when there was tremendous uh, crushing poverty, uh, especially in the, the American South, uh, where I'm from and where I live, um, to a, a brighter land in California, um, that uh, the loss of that connection to the land can be depersonalizing and dehumanizing. And Dr. Collier made the analogy that likewise, when a physician loses his touch and his connection with the patient, um, 
when the physician misses uh, the whole purpose of why he's there, um, there can almost be a degradation of the physician-patient relationship to a, a mechanistic, uh, machine-like uh, uh, relationship. And so uh, she was talking about, uh, continue on under this first subpoint, uh, the three types of knowledge that the physician is to have. Uh, episteme, which is the bare knowledge. Uh, techne, which is the sort of how-to apply that bare knowledge. Um, uh, but most importantly, the phronesis, uh, the wisdom, the why of what we are doing. Uh, and she quoted this from Greek philosophy, but it also has application in the Christian New Testament, uh, particularly the issue of phronesis. Uh, there's a Greek word, sophronismos, or sophroneu, um, that is uh, to be of sound mind. Uh, it's used six times in the New Testament, uh, twice of which is when Jesus heals the Gerasene demoniac, uh, which is connection to uh, our discussion today on medicine, uh, that uh, after Jesus had cast the demons out of the man and cast them into the swine, which then drowned in the Sea of Galilee, um, that the man was sitting clothed and in his right mind, which I find just a profound verse. Maybe I'll do a video on that story someday. Um, but uh, there's a, a soundness, there's a, a, a clarity uh, in that third type of knowledge, phronesis, uh, that is the real driving point uh, behind what we do. And uh, how medicine is not merely a technical profession in the sense of technique or a bare knowledge profession in the sense of episteme, but the application of both of those to a greater purpose which is the health of our patients uh, in the phronesis. Um, then she moved on to address the issue of burnout um, and how the slow depersonalization that can happen to physicians uh, over the course of their career as they lose um, the basis behind why they're doing what they're doing and how once the physician has depersonalized his or her patients, he then begins to depersonalize himself, which then leads to burnout. And the medical literature is just chock full of studies uh, regarding uh, the rates of burnout, uh, physician suicide. We lose about a medical school class of physicians every year to um, suicide, um, which is uh, one of the unspoken tragedies in our profession. Um, and uh, that uh, we need to take into account why we're doing what we're doing in order to find strategies to uh, deal with burnout when it comes and uh, to prevent it uh, the best that we can. Um, just as a quick aside regarding the machine thing, she had also made a great point about how robots and machines are being more involved in patient care. I see this with my own research in artificial intelligence, um, in medicine, uh, electronic medical records. Um, but uh, in spite of all of these machines and robots and computers that we have that uh, assist us uh, today, that uh, a robot can never provide care to a patient in the way that a human can. Um, that there's a connection that is special between the doctor and the patient um, that just doesn't happen with the machine. Um, and so she then uh, sort of moved on talking about um, asking big questions and the importance of uh, talking and discussing with colleagues and patients whom you may have disagreements with on a range of issues, whether that be bigger issues or even the small, seemingly small um, or isolated uh, issues of uh, patient care and a uh, particular treatment or diagnostic decision that needs to be made. Um, those are actually very big decisions, uh, not small in the slightest. Um, and uh, how when we close ourselves close ourselves off as professionals to people who have a disagreement with us that we lose an opportunity to grow um, 
And then she moved on to the third point, the third sub-point about practicing gratitude, um, which I found to be the best point that she made in the entire speech. Um, she asked the big question, uh, tying back to point number two, uh, why do, or who do we include in our moral view of health? Um, does that include the pregnant mother? Absolutely. Um, but I think the implication that she made in her speech is that it also includes the unborn baby. Uh, she acknowledged the deep wounds over the Dobbs decision in her own community. Um, I probably wouldn't have worded it that way. Um, I have nothing but unmixed joy for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, but uh, she, in her speech, I guess in the context she's in, felt the need to address the disappointment of her colleagues. Um, and so I thought it was very um, interesting that she did that. Um, but getting back to the point of health and you know who is included in health, she also asked the even more basic question is, what is health? And she made a very deep point that health is not just the absence of disease. That's not the definition of health that um, is the best definition, that health speaks to something deeper that speaks to the created order was a quote that she had and that ultimately comes back to, and then she used the, the Hebrew term shalom, peace, that uh, somebody comes to peace uh, with themselves, their surroundings with other people, but most importantly, um, as she alluded to in her talk with the Creator, with God Himself, um, that's a deeply Christian response um, that she gave as to the definition of health. Um, we think from the Christian context, you know, not just about physical health and all the miracles of healing that Jesus and the apostles did um, during uh, their earthly ministries, um, but the spiritual health, uh, I think, is especially of Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have as a present tense reality of a past tense action Irene, it's where we get the female name Irene. Um, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew shalom. It's peace, not merely an absence of war or in the case of medicine, an absence of disease, but true positive peace and right relationship with God. Um, and so I, I thought that was very good um, that she said, uh, or what, of what she said. She talked about becoming acquainted with grief and how that helps us to cultivate this attitude of gratitude. And she especially mentioned uh, the story of her colleague, uh, Jake, who uh, was her chief resident during her third year of residency. Um, that he was one of the hardest working guys uh, in the residency cohort, that he was bright and that he was dedicated, that he was hardworking and um, that uh, he was just a, a great guy to be around. And one day uh, he started moving a little bit slower. And this is a young man, um, started having more fatigue, um, but kept pushing through it and was telling everybody, no, it's all right, I'm gonna be okay, there's nothing wrong. And in the end, uh, one night he ended up having to be rushed to the emergency department after collapsing and they imaged him and they found multiple masses in his liver. And for anybody in medicine, that's uh, a bad sign. It's a portent of some sort of metastatic cancer that has spread throughout the body and is incurable at that point. And um, she mentioned how after Jake had died, um, leaving behind a young wife and a grieving family and a shocked residency cohort, um, 
for someone to die of cancer at such a young age like that with his life ahead of him that uh, it devastated everybody that she was around. Uh, and she had a quote that I thought was, was very good. She said, we lost faith in medicine as our savior. We made medicine into what people used to call or what theologians used to call an idol. But she said what she had taken away from that and looking back many years later now, she says, when idols come crashing down, it's painful, it hurts. When we have something that we have set up, that we have invested our time in um, as an end in and of itself, um, that when those idols come crashing down, it brings about pain initially, but ultimately it brings about a right state of things. Um, and I saw an article where she was being interviewed, that is Dr. Collier, um, about her conversion as a Christian and you know her husband going to a Bible study and being saved and um, taking their children to church by himself. And then uh, she dealing with burnout and um, depersonalization and going to a Bible study uh, from, uh, I guess it was a nurse assistant or a patient, I can't remember, uh, who happened to be a pastor's wife. And uh, completely changing her, uh, what we Christians would call being born again, um, that the Reformers and uh, theologians of old called regeneration, um, that uh, it gave her a sense of propriety and uh, right understanding and right uh, mindset about uh, going forward um, in her practice of medicine that wasn't there before. Um, and so then she finished talking about treating and caring for patients who are different than us and um, how looking on this controversy from the outside there's a lot of people who have a lot of comments about the medical students. It's not my place to comment on their individual actions. Uh, but what I will say is what uh, Vinay mentioned in his video um, is that they missed a really big opportunity um, to hear from a speaker that they disagree with. Um, I have a friend of mine who said he actually thought what they did was perfectly in keeping with their conscience, that they believe that she is some sort of moral monster like a Joseph Stalin for being pro-choice or pro-life uh, and, uh, you know, that it was perfectly reasonable for them in their worldview, even though this friend of mine is quite opposite of the worldview of these medical students, um, that uh, what they did was, was right from their perspective. And while I hear that argument, uh, I think it misses the broader point that Dr. Prasad was bringing up that this is what makes physicians physicians is treating people who might look different from us, um, might believe differently than us, um, speak differently than us. And, um, that that role that we have as physicians that is deeply grounded in the Western tradition um, is particularly grounded in uh, the faith of the New Testament and the medical profession that we have today is um, a branch off of the stem, uh, off of the great tree that is New Testament Christianity that uh, profoundly and forever altered the Western world from what it was before, and not just the Western world, but even the world itself. Uh, the light that the Christian gospel brings in um, to do not just the negative aspects of the Old Testament Jewish law, but to do the positive aspects. And uh, it reminded me of a story uh, from the Bible uh, in Luke chapter 10, and we'll talk about that real quick, and then I'll just 
make a few final uh, comments uh, regarding uh, a post that I put on Vinay's channel that uh, has gotten a lot of reaction. Um, and then uh, the future of Christians in the medical profession in the Western world. Um, but let's go and take a look, uh, open our Bibles, and uh, take a look at Luke chapter 10 starting in verse 25, and so the context here is Jesus and his disciples are going about, you know, Jesus is healing, and he is, you know, teaching and doing many profound things um, uh, in his ministry. Uh, he had just sent out the 70, uh, the 70 who are sort of the outer group of disciples uh, in addition to the 12, and... Um, there was, you know, great rejoicing over people who were believing in Jesus and his ministry is growing and becoming more popular. And this has drawn the attention of the religious leaders in his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, who were uh, ruling over the people of Israel, uh, who held uh, the 70 seats, a uh, different 70, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, ruling over the nation of Israel, uh, as the client council dealing over religious and personal affairs uh, for the Jewish people under the Roman occupation, always subject to the governor, uh, the Roman governor and the client king Herod, um, but still uh, taking care of many of the day-to-day -day decisions of the people. Um, and as we know from the New Testament, uh, our Lord has many criticisms, uh, good criticisms, right criticisms, and even condemnation. Uh, for the religious leaders of his day who were leading uh, the nation of Israel astray uh, in his day. And so the context here, verse 25, it says, a lawyer stood up. And so you can almost imagine this being some sort of proto-yeshiva where there are rabbinical students and uh, this is very common in Jewish culture, from what I understand, um, where you'll have a rabbi who gives up and he stands up in the yeshiva and he'll do the teaching and the students will just start, you know, asking questions, you know, what about this rabbi or what about that rabbi? And, you know, really putting the rabbi to the test um, in terms of, uh, you know, his theological knowledge and his application of that theological knowledge and so when it says a lawyer, this is a, a Torah teacher. This is somebody who studies the law of Moses, uh, very similar to the ultra-Orthodox today in Israel, who um, all day, every day, all they do is pray and read the Torah and recite the Torah and memorize the Torah and talk about the Torah. Um, and they do that in a professional sense. Um, and so that's what a lawyer is. It's not like an attorney today that's sort of lost in the, the translation um, as well as the, uh, the our divorce from this cultural context for those who are not close to Jewish culture. Um, so that's the context. And so Jesus and his disciples are there, and it seems like there's you know a good number of Pharisees uh, or Sadducees um, who are questioning him and uh, you know putting him to the test as a rabbi. And so it says a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying. Didaskalia, uh, or didaskalos in the Greek, uh, it's, we know in uh, the Aramaic, uh, Rabboni, uh, you know, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, well, you're a lawyer, so this is me talking, he says, what is written in the Namas, the Torah? How does it read to you? And he, that is the lawyer, the Torah teacher, the yeshiva student, so to speak, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and with all your, and your neighbor as yourself. So he quotes from Deuteronomy um, chapter 6, verse 4, Shema Yisrael Adonai Lachem Adonai Echad, you know, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Amen. Um, but then he quotes, um, I believe it's from Leviticus 19, uh, after this. And he says, and your neighbor 
as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And so you're like, okay, Jesus has affirmed the knowledge, the uh, episteme of this rabbinical student, that uh, he understands the text correctly, that he has the mental knowledge and the mental assent of what the greatest commandment is and then what the second greatest commandment is. Um, there was a debate in that day whether uh, keeping the Sabbath day or between, and this comes back to the two houses of the Pharisees, uh, Shammai and then Hillel. Um, the house of Shammai, Shammai oddly enough being Hillel's father-in-law, um, this is before the time of Jesus, uh, Shammai saying that, you know, you shall remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, that that was the second greatest commandment, whereas Hillel said that the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbors yourself. And so it seems that Jesus is uh, following uh, Hillel's uh, understanding of the text. Um, and so um, the rabbinical student, the, the lawyer, he's answered correctly. Uh, he's you know, got the right understanding of the text. And Jesus says, now go apply it. Do this and you will live. But then it says in verse 29 something interesting. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Well, this is a very good question. Who is your neighbor? And what I think he had in the back of his mind, going to Leviticus 19, uh, we read this, uh, starting in verse 13 of Leviticus chapter 19. You shall not oppress your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God, I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. So we're starting to get a sense that your neighbor is the blind, your neighbor is the poor, but it's also the rich man, uh, that it's people from every strata of society. Continuing on in verse 16, you shall not go about as a slanderer among your people. And this is where I think the lawyer questioning Jesus is trying to make a point. Your people, who's your people? And you are not to act against the life of your neighbor, I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so what I think this lawyer wishing to justify himself was saying, Sure, Rabbi, I'll be good to the poor man among the sons of Israel. I won't show deference to the rich man among the sons of Israel. I won't cause a stumbling block to be put in front of the blind man among the sons of Israel. But I can do any of those things that I want to to those filthy Gentiles because they're just dogs and goyim and they're not really my neighbor. I think that's what that man was thinking. Maybe I'm wrong, but given the context of Leviticus chapter 19 and the self-righteousness of the Jews and their contempt for Gentiles who lived among them in Judea uh, and uh, in the first century, I think that's what this lawyer had in mind. But then Jesus does something profound. Starting in verse 30, Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, down being down the mountain because Jerusalem is in a very hilly place. And you go down in altitude, down in sea level, from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is in a plain and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance, a priest. This is a son of Aaron. This is someone of the Aaronic priesthood. The highest rung of Jewish society in that day. Jesus says, And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also. This is my people. The outer priesthood, the those who were not descended directly from Aaron, but who were from the tribe of Aaron and Moses, uh, the tribe of Levi, who held the outer priesthood, the, the lesser priesthood that uh, assisted the uh, sons of Aaron with the temple service, uh, the singing and the pitching of the tabernacle and the moving of the sacred objects that was entrusted to the Levites. So the second greatest in society. Likewise, also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And now the lawyer is getting all puffed up with pride, thinking, ah, and now he's going to say, and the Pharisee came by and did good to the man. But that's not what Jesus says. Verse 33 of Luke 10. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. You can imagine the stunned silence among the Pharisees who are questioning Jesus at this point. The Samaritan? The half-breed? The one descended from the ten northern tribes, uh, who was also mixed with Assyrians and Babylonians and Arameans and you know, other Gentile enemy nations of Israel, these Samaritans who worship on Mount Gerizim, who are heretics, who they only accept the five books of Moses and don't accept the Psalms or the Proverbs or the Prophets or the historical books. You mean a Samaritan? Jesus says in verse 36, And which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? A shocking rebuke of our Lord to the self-righteous Pharisees, the self-righteous religious elite of his day. A rebuke to the self-righteous elite in secular society today, including physicians, many of whom might look down upon people who are different than them. Continuing on and finishing up in verse 37, you can almost hear the begrudging mixture of shame and anger in the defeated anger in the, the voice of the, uh, the pharisaical lawyer here. And he said to Jesus' question, the one who showed mercy toward him. And now Jesus repeats his prior command of do this and live. For Jesus says, then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. And the implication of there is not just to your fellow Israelite, not just to your fellow Jew, but to anyone whom God may providentially put in your path who needs you to be a neighbor to them. So I think this is a story that has application with what Dr. Collier was saying that in a lot of ways the medical profession is built upon this kind of Christian New Testament value system 
that we're to love those who hate us, we're to love those who are different than us, that doesn't mean that we can't hold certain political positions, you know, or think that, you know, have disagreements about what might be the best course of action for things like immigration, for things like um, the profanation of marriage in our society, um, the uh, tax raid, whatever issue it might be. I'm a very traditional paleo-conservative in all of these issues, so you can understand where my position is on things like immigration restrictionism or having English as the national language in the United States or you know things of that nature. Um, but that's not the point of either what Dr. Collier was talking about or what I'm making today. The point is, is that we as physicians have a moral and ethical obligation to treat those especially who are different than us um, with love and with compassion. Which brings me to uh, my final point. Um, I think the medical students who walked out of the speech, they missed something very good that Dr. Collier said. Um, they missed a speech that I think could have um, allowed them to learn something from somebody who had a different political point of view, somebody who has a different moral and ethical point of view, and uh, they missed that opportunity. I'm afraid that with the increasing secularization of our society, the brainwashing of our young people in government schools and by academia, our undergraduate universities, um, the media, popular culture, uh, and this um, twisted and perverse secular humanism that is the religion of our land today, that uh, cancel culture um, is going to become more mainstreamed and more accepted even than it is right now as time goes along. Um, I'm especially concerned in light of what happened in Canada within the past few years with the Trinity University Law School being stripped of its ability to grant uh, recognized law degrees to its students because of its Christian convictions against uh, the profanation of marriage um, and uh, its Christian convictions in other areas that uh, it is going to become increasingly difficult for believing confessional Christians, as well as those who are co-belligerents in our culture who have differences of opinion with us on the Bible, um, but who may hold to similar moral and ethical systems, um, that... Uh, the chance for us to have this profession open to us is going to become uh, less and less. I've had conversations with medical students here at my church uh, just regarding the whole transgenderism issue and the really dark and just leaves me without words, difficult uh, experiences that they have had that even I, going through medical school, you know, five to ten years ago, didn't experience. Um, that it's getting even harder than it was when I was in medical school, which is, is difficult uh, to imagine. Um, but uh, the indoctrination that they're receiving and the ability to push back and to boldly speak uh, for Christ uh, in this setting is becoming more and more limited. Um, so I don't know what the future is. Um, it would be hard, but what I do know is that if it was between Christ and the medical profession, um, Dr. Bob would, with much pain, um, but out of duty and out of a recognition of the grace that he has been given, 
would lay aside the title doctor and just be Bob if it came between my profession and my Lord. I believe my profession is the gifting and the talent uh, that God has given me um, to help others, to provide for my family as well in this life. Um, but we have no guarantees in this life. Just as uh, Jake, um, Dr. Collier's uh, colleague, had no guarantee. One year he's living his life and going through medical training, and the next year it's it's gone, and he's has to stand before his creator, um, either in righteousness or unrighteousness, um, which is a profound and sobering thought. Um, but ultimately, I'd have to choose Christ. Um, Christians are already persecuted around the world. Places like Pakistan, they're not allowed to hold the upper positions in society. China, North Korea, Vietnam, many places in Latin America where the gangs have taken over Christian pastors and others are persecuted and not allowed to live a normal life. Um, that maybe we're going to experience a little bit of that here in the West. But uh, yeah, so in light of that, I commented on Dr. Prasad's video and was like, you know, thank you for, from a evangelical, confessional, pro-life Christian who um, is believes differently um, that thank you, Vinay, thank you, Dr. Prasad, for standing up for our right to be physicians, to enter the medical profession, um, and uh, to be willing to call his colleagues. I pray for Dr. Prasad that he would come to know Christ and his fullness, and that uh, Lord, uh, uh, that God would bring Vinay to a knowledge of the truth. Um, so those are my thoughts. Those are my comments. Uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe on the video. And uh, I'd love to continue to get to know you guys more as I move back to making videos. And uh, uh, with that, I'll leave you with uh, the Apostle Paul's admonition uh, that uh, grace and peace be with you all. Um, in Christ's name, amen.